After receiving a death sentence, Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, is shown sitting in court. You maggots make me ill, he snarls. After gathering himself, he continues, You don't get me. You're not required to. I'll be vindicated. We all contain Lucifer. This is one of the reasons this individual was dubbed as evil. He was a serial murderer who appeared to recognize his wicked nature and was maybe carrying out the devil's will. He seems to enjoy his celebrity position as well, not unlike other psychotic serial killers like Ted Bundy. The missionary kind of serial killers. Murderers who, for some bizarre reason, believe they are carrying out the will of a higher power, is one of the groups into which they occasionally fall. However, Ramirez appeared to believe that Satan had hired him. Normally, they would claim that they are working for God, cleaning the streets, getting rid of the human filth, etc. What were they hired for? You could ask. Given the severity of his insanity, more of his outbursts in court would somewhat, though not totally, explain it. I don't believe in the moralistic, hypocritical dogmas of this so-called civilization, he declared. I need only glance outside of this chamber to see the trematodes of the earth, the liars, the hateful, the murderers, the crooks, and the paranoid cowards, each of whom practices law. The term trematode refers to a specific category of parasite. There are others who murder for policy, clandestinely or publicly, as do governments of the world, which kill in the name of God or nation, according to Ramirez, who criticized society for what he perceived as its hypocrisy. Some could have said at the time, Okay, Richard, perhaps you are correct that several governments across the world have committed despicable acts in the name of imperialism and economic might, but how does it justify what you have done, namely commit some of the biggest crimes in American history? Now let's rewind a few years. Jenny Vinkow, 79, was discovered dead in her Northeast Los Angeles residence on June 28, 1984. The burglar entered the house while she was sleeping, according to police, and stabbed her with a knife. Because of how vicious the attack had been, police weren't sure it was a break and gone wrong at first. The murderer deliberately went overboard. Ramirez didn't launch another attack for over a year. That is when he shot Maria Hernandez, a 22-year-old woman. Her roommate didn't make it out alive, she did. He shot and murdered a 30-year-old lady less than an hour later. Even in violent LDA, two murders and one attempted murder within an hour was a major event. According to the newspapers, a ghoul of some sort was prowling the streets at night and was described as having decaying teeth and bulging eyes. In the media, he was referred to as the Valley Intruder, a bougie man par excellence. He had just just begun. Vincent and Maxine Zatsara, a married couple, were slain by him ten days later. When the police came, they discovered Maxine's corpse had been severely mangled, with the eyes missing. Although the same type of pistol had been used in the earlier killings, they now had another piece of information. That was the mark left by a pair of sneakers named Brand and Avia in a flower bed. An additional couple was slain by him about a month and a half later. He attacked two sisters who were both in their 80s two weeks later. He brutally beat them with a hammer and even tortured one of them with an electrical cable. Amazingly, both of them made it through, albeit one of the women passed away shortly after from her wounds. This time, the invader had left a new trail of evidence. He had drawn a satanic pentagram on the walls of the bedroom using some lipstick he had discovered about the home. Additionally, he had a pentagram painted on one of the victim's thighs. He went into the house of a mother and her 11-year-old kid the day following that. While beating the woman, he yelled at her, Don't look at me, or I'll chop out your eyes. But this time he left no dead victims. He once thought he saw electrical sparks while attempting to strangle a victim with a telephone cable. He subsequently said that he left that woman alone after that, thinking that Jesus had shown himself and defended her. Did he actually think that? We believe he most likely did. He demanded to know where all the valuables in the home were with the help of another victim he had bound. Swear on Satan, he said, begging her to be honest. The same evening that he killed another elderly woman, he also did it. On her damaged face, footprints were discovered. They might be linked to a set of footwear made by Avia.
Two weeks later, he killed another senior married couple with a machete and a rifle. Once more, he removed a lot of goods from the home. So what did the cops examine then? This case was a little bit odd in terms of criminal characteristics in that the serial murderer stole from the victims. Many serial killers are not at all motivated by financial gain. Killing is a psychosexual act, and the motivation is one of money to buy new goods. Then there were the references to Satan and the Satanic emblems. Ramirez also inscribed Jack the Knife on one of his murder scenes, possibly in reference to the notorious Jack the Ripper. This murderer sought renown for his atrocities, much like the never-caught Jack in London. However, the L.A. killer didn't appear to be organized, or at least not very organized, in the words of FBI profilers. Ted Bundy and other organized murderers typically study police methods and take considerable efforts to escape capture. Instead of being street hustlers and chronic drug users like Ramirez, they are frequently fairly intelligent and can be the person next door with a nice job. Ramirez occasionally lacked what criminologists refer to as forensic awareness. When a more cunning murderer would have known better, he left tracks behind. Some of his victims were able to see him, and he chose to spare them. This killer didn't really fall into any type of category, according to the FBI's team tasked with capturing serial killers, known as the Behavioral Sciences Unit. Think Silence of the Lambs. He possessed traits of all kinds. It's evident that he enjoyed dominating his victims. Given how he tormented some of them, he was undoubtedly a sadist, but he was also a two-bit thief. Additionally, serial killers, or at least the organized variety, typically thoroughly plot their killings. It appeared as though the murderer was on some sort of irrational frenzy. He committed crimes one after another. One of them involved Ramirez going inside a house of family. After severely assaulting the woman, he instantly murdered the male and forced her to swear on Satan, while asking her where all the valuables were hidden. In this instance, he moved the boy to a neighbor where he said he would be safe instead of merely refraining from attacking him. Then the police got a break. They discovered a footprint following yet another attack, and this time it was almost probably from a pair of avia shoes. It was good for the investigation because the detectives learned that this specific style wasn't very widespread in the U.S. They'd learned that just a small percentage of those styles pairs delivered to the U.S. were size 11 and a half. Since just one store in the city had gotten a pair, finding that size in L.A. was actually rather difficult. Additionally, ballistic evidence may be used to connect the crimes. However, there is a valid reason why the police withhold their leads from the media and other parties. Of course, this is because the murderer would be alerted if information about their investigation were to leak. How the Night Stalker, a serial killer, was caught Naturally, the majority of murderers keep up with their atrocities through the press. Police do reveal offenders' drawings so that members of the public may come forward if they believe they know the offender, but they also tend to hold a lot of information back. One purpose is to avoid giving the criminal a heads-up, and another is to prevent the accused from accidentally disclosing information to the culprit during questioning. In this instance, Diane Feinstein, who was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, spoke in a news conference about the shoes and the gun's caliber. Undoubtedly, Mayor Feinstein erred, a detective subsequently remarked. The error was roughly equivalent to the Nazis openly disclosing the specifics of their impending blitzkrieg. After witnessing that on TV, what did Ramirez do? Naturally, he disposed of the shoes by taking them to the Golden Gate Bridge and hurling them into the ocean. The police suffered a severe setback as a result. Imagine if Ramirez had been taken into custody while wearing a rifle that matched his outfit and a pair of shoes that resembled a lucky four-leaf clover. By the way, because of a similar incident in San Francisco, Feinstein had been informed about the specifics of the L.A. crimes, but she wasn't supposed to discuss them in public. She did, at least, make a few good decisions, one of which was expressing the obvious. This is a pretty dangerous problem, she remarked. The murderer enters a house at night and picks victims at random. Someone is giving this nasty serial murderer a room, an apartment, or a house to rent somewhere in the Bay Area. Ramirez wasn't as smart as most detectives believed he would be since he didn't toss the pistol away. 
A week later, in Orange County, he was lurking outside another family's house. The guy of the home ran him away, but he was able to provide police a description of the automobile and a portion of the license plate. He was unaware that it was the Night Stalker's vehicle. Ramirez also went into another home that evening and shot a guy three times in the head. He thrashed the man's wife while she was restrained, telling her to tell him again that she cherished Satan. She was left alive with the instruction to call the police and say, tell them the Night Stalker was here. After surgery, the patient did live. Despite Ramirez's best efforts to clean his abandoned stolen automobile, police not only discovered another footprint, but also removed a fingerprint from the rear view mirror. Ramirez was unaware that California had just purchased a new machine. Cal ID was the brand name of a $25 million computer system. A fingerprint might be run through that by police, and it would be compared to fingerprints from past crimes. Back then, this was a really high-tech device. Although it is claimed that this solved the case, it isn't exactly accurate. Because Ramirez had taken so much from so many people, the police already had a ton of leads. He had caged them in on the streets, and the cops had a trail on some of the objects. They were informed that the individual who had sold them was either Rick or maybe Ricardo. Then, police unveiled a photograph of Ramirez that had been taken during his 1984 arrest for auto theft. Additionally, they made a statement that said, We now know who you are, and soon everyone else will. You won't have somewhere to hide. They were aware that they were looking for a 25-year-old Texas wanderer with a drug usage past. They were unaware that this little boy had witnessed a murder when he was a child and was a very damaged child on top of previous traumas. Ramirez was largely a loner who wandered about, using drugs wherever he could get them, so not many people knew him. When he wasn't listening to Black Sabbath, AC slash DC, or post-Sabbath Ozzy Osbourne at home alone, he watched just about every kind of horror film. We won't belittle his musical tastes, but Ramirez used gloomy music as a kind of defiance against his strict mother and abusive father. Ramirez's brain was seriously fried by the time he was 17 according to one serial killer book. Add some LSD, amphetamine, PCP, the murder he witnessed, and some further violence. Ramirez transitioned to cocaine via the mainline, and when high, he occasionally read the Satanic Bible and participated in pagan rites. He then started killing after that. He hadn't checked the news and had no clue that numerous people had seen his picture, but he was now in hiding. When he boarded a bus to visit his brother in Arizona, he was unaware that his face was plastered over nearly every front-page newspaper in California. He would have recognized his face if he had just gone to a newspaper stand. When the great majority of people wouldn't have minded lynching him, this man was wandering the streets. At one point, he was able to elude several officers who were searching for him and enter a convenience shop. The problem was that a bunch of geriatric women had seen him. El Matador, which means the murderer, was what they were calling each other as they were almost trembling. For Ramirez, things had changed within the shop. That's because he suddenly had newspapers in front of him that featured his face. He went back outside, where more people were staring at him. He dashed off crossing the highway quickly, and then made an unsuccessful attempt to steal a vehicle. He continued to run, leaping over garden gates as he made another attempt to steal a car. Helicopters were now buzzing in the sky. Angie de la Torre was a passenger in one of the cars that Ramirez was able to enter. Her 57-year-old neighbor, Jose Burgone, arrived on the scene shortly after the attacker hit her in the stomach and took the keys. Burgoyne subsequently stated to the reporters, I raced to defend her, and he said, Don't approach closer or I'll shoot you. I opened the door and took him out of the car after I didn't spot a pistol. When more individuals arrived, the situation became chaotic. Now a daylight brawler, the Night Stalker wasn't very adept at it. When De La Torre's husband arrived, he violently struck Ramirez with what he claimed to be a BB key tool. Ramirez escaped once more, only to be pursued down a street that began to resemble the gauntlet in a Mexican-American gladiator's adaptation in which the preferred weapons were not made of soft rubber. Ramirez was knocked out when someone struck him over the head with a fence post. 
Now the tumultuous mob attacked him and severely thrashed him. Had some people not shown restraint and the police not intervened, he may have been executed in front of everyone there. Later, Ramirez was scheduled to visit the gas chamber. Women wrote in fan letters while he was behind bars, as is typical with serial killers. Even when he was imprisoned, he married a lady. The Night Stalker was never put to death by the government. Instead, he passed away in 2013 from problems brought on by B cell lymphoma. He was 53. Thank you for watching. Give a like if you liked it. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to Fact?